Today, we are starting a new series. It's a two-week series on discipleship, and I have a question for you. It's a bit of like a melancholy type question as we get started, but I want you to imagine for a moment, uh, you're on your deathbed, okay, and you have everybody you love sitting next to you. And as they're sitting next to you, you have one final piece of advice you can give your family. You can give your kids, you can give your grandkids, you can give your great grandkids. Now, obviously, you're going to tell your family that you love them, but if you had to give them one piece of advice, what would it be? Go ahead and take a moment, think about it. I'll give you a couple seconds. One piece of advice you would tell your kids and your grandkids on your de deathbed. Um, some of you, and I was thinking about culture, what culture would say, maybe they would say is like, hey, do what makes you happy. Or, or some other people would say, you know, go travel the world. Some of you might get really practical. Just eat more pizza, okay? <laughs> maybe for the reason you are there, you're saying actually you should eat more kale, okay? Root for Michigan football, okay? Maybe that would be yours. Nope, no, nobody. What's interesting about final words is they're important. In fact, you'll see all over like clickbait articles about it was this person's final words they said. What was it? And then you click on the article and you read what it was. When I think about the life of Jesus, he had some last words. Uh, Jesus shared his last words before he ascended into heaven with his disciples. Now, I want you to think about that. When you read the Bible, I think it's important um, to really think through what's happening in Scripture and to kind of insert yourself in the story sometimes to think, what would I be thinking if I were those disciples? I mean, think about that. Imagine you are literally talking to Jesus. He says his last words, and then he just ascends into heaven. And you're just like talking to Jesus, and then you're like, What? He just ascends into heaven. But what were the last words that Jesus said? And why is it important for us? If you have a Bible, I want you to open up to Matthew chapter 28. That's where we're going to be diving in this morning. And in Matthew chapter 28, here's what Jesus says at the beginning. He said, then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what's Jesus prefacing this with? He's saying, I'm about to give you a command, and the reason I can give you this command is because all authority in heaven and in, on earth have been given to me. So if you're in the military, imagine your superior comes up to you, and before he gives you the command, he reminds you of his rank and your rank before he says what he's about to say. I'm your superior. Here's what you need to do. If you're a player and you have a coach, the coach is saying, hey, I'm the coach. Here is the play that you need to run. And since Jesus uh, is equivalent to the Father as being God, he can give us commands. And here's what Jesus says next. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach them to obey everything I have commanded to you. Jesus is saying, since I have all authority, here's what you need to do. I don't just have some authority, I have all authority, and I want you to preach my gospel to everybody, every single person, to all nations, not just one nation, but every single nation. Why? Because every person is important to God. He tells them to, to teach them to obey everything. He wants us to build and to make disciples. A disciple is a person who consistently follows the rule of Jesus in their life. The focus that Jesus has is not that we would just see more converts. A convert is someone who converts to Christianity, okay? And that's a great thing. But the problem with just focusing on conversion is conversion focuses on getting people to heaven. Discipleship is focused on having the God of heaven dictate what he wants you to do on earth. And there's a difference. The problem with the church oftentimes isn't that we don't have enough converts, it's that we don't have enough disciples. We have people who will say, I will make a decision to follow Jesus so that I can go to heaven, but I won't follow the rule of Jesus in my everyday life. And Jesus is not looking for that. Jesus wants wholehearted devotion to his ways and to teach him those ways. So the question we are asking this morning is, what does it look like to make disciples? And if uh, kind of our big idea today, if you're taking notes, is this. We want to be a church who makes disciples that make disciples. 
Make disciples that make disciples. And I know over the last five weeks, we've talked about a lot of heavy topics. And I'll say over the last five weeks, you may have been uncomfortable to say amen at certain things because we were talking about a lot of these different topics. If this is your first time at Purpose Church, we love reading God's word. We say God's word is as relevant today as the days it was written. We wanna be people who lean into what God has for us and we wanna be excited about the preaching of God's word. So at any point, if you feel spurred on, you can say amen this morning, okay? Amen. There we go. Okay, I'm trying to get you guys in this, all right? This week, we're going to answer this question. What does winning look like as a Christian? What does winning look like as a disciple of Jesus? Next week, we're going to ask the question, what is a disciple and what does it mean to be a disciple? So the first thing we need to understand when it comes to discipleship to Jesus and making disciples, we have to know if we're going to win at discipleship, we need to recognize it's not a suggestion. It's a command. Making disciples is not just like if you want to do this or not. Jesus gives the command. Did any of you grow up in middle school going to like a, a roller skating rink? Anybody? Anybody? We got a few of you. Okay. Okay. I want to take you back to your eighth grade self for a moment. All right. Imagine your mom drops you off for us. It was called Ohio Skate. All right. And I'm in seventh grade. I'm looking good as a seventh grade, seventh grader, you know, most awkward stage of life. You walk in, you hang out with your buddies. You're having so much fun. You got your iPod touch. You're listening to Fallout Boy. You're hanging out with your boys. Like things are going really, really well. Uh, you're playing ping pong. You're eating popcorn. Maybe you get an icy blueberry. Our blueberry is kind of my favorite one. Uh, but then you put in like a little tint of cherry and it just tastes so good. And you're having so much fun during the skating options. And you go onto the skating rink and, and you can go fast. You can go slow. You can do spins. Like you are awesome, Okay. And then there comes this point, right, when you're at the skating rink as a middle schooler, that some dude comes over the PA, and you know what he says? He says, it's time for the all skate, okay? Do you remember the all skate? It didn't matter if you were in the bathroom, if you were eating, if you were playing in the arcade room, everybody participated in the all skate, okay? It was the most fun part of the skating rink when everybody got in there and everybody participated. When Jesus gives this announcement to make disciples, he says, this is an all skate for anybody who follows me. Everybody is a part of this. Jesus says, you cannot unsubscribe from this command, okay? Some of you, you don't even unsubscribe emails anymore. You have 37,459 emails. And if that's you, I want to tell you, you give me anxiety, okay? That is, that's a killer. Jesus says, this is for every single person. And Jesus is not giving this command as a Midwesterner. Do I have anybody who grew up in the Midwest? You're going to know what I'm about to say, all right? When you grew up in the Midwest and you ask for something from anyone, here's how you ask. Hey, Johnny, do you think perhaps maybe I know you have a lot going on and there's things going on and I know you're really busy and I know you got a lot of things going on, but I'm just wondering if you could perhaps maybe, and after you caveat the heck out of a statement, you will finally make the ask, okay? That is a Midwesterner ask. Basically, what you're doing is you're giving them about 150 outs to do what you're going to ask them to do, okay? Jesus did not do that when it came to making disciples, he didn't look at his disciples and he said, hey, Peter, I know you're a little busy, but if you could get to it, could you make some disciples? Hey, John, I know you got a lot of kids at home, but at some point, you know, after that kid, you know, graduates, then, then can you start living out your purpose, John? No, 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 no. Jesus says we are called to make disciples and it doesn't matter what stage of life you're in. We are called to follow Jesus, to give him everything and help make disciples. The reason is Jesus is saying, why in the world would I die on a cross and give opportunities for people to be saved and no one shares this message? Romans chapter 10 says this, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? The gospel is meant to be spread. The gospel is this. It is the good news that God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for us because we have all sinned. And since we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we needed a perfect sacrifice. And God sent Jesus to die on a cross so that we all could be reconciled to God when we place our faith and our trust in him. That's the gospel. 
If you've never made that decision to follow Jesus, it's the most important decision you could ever make, but it doesn't stop there. That is the start of our relationship with God. That is not the finish line of our relationship with God. Jesus is so passionate about discipleship. This is what he says in John chapter 17. He said, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. Notice this. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now that they know everything you've given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. When you continue to read in these verses, Jesus says that he has came and he has completed the work that God had given him to do. Think about that. If you know this portion of scripture, Jesus has not died yet. He has not resurrected yet, but he says that he has come and he has completed the work that that God gave him to do. Why did he say that? Because the work that God gave him to do was discipleship. It was in this verse when he says, they obeyed your word. That one of the primary reasons that Jesus came was obviously to die and to be resurrected, but it was to disciple his disciples so they could spread the message of the gospel. How did he disciple them? He, he helped them obey his word. That's the work of a disciple. It's us coming alongside other people and discipling them to obey God's word, that we believe in this word, that we trust in this word, and if this word says it, we do it. That's what we believe. And and discipleship, this is kind of our next point, I encourage you if you're taking notes, discipleship is complete when the person you are discipling can make a disciple. And we're all called to do that. Discipleship is complete when you are discipling, when the person you're discipling can disciple another person. This is the bullseye of Christianity. It's discipleship one by one. You come alongside someone, you teach them what you know about following Jesus, and you help them take a next step in following Jesus. And the way that this message spreads and permeates the world is one by one. Have you ever went to a wedding uh, with a sparkle or send off? Well, what'll happen is basically someone will get married and they're about to go off and they're getting in their car and they're going to drive away. But before that, everybody who's attending the wedding gets out there and they start passing out these sparklers. And when they pass out the sparklers, one person um, basically lights their sparkler and then they take their sparkler and they help light the other person's. And then that person helps light another person's. And that is a view of the gospel, that is a view of discipleship, that it is one by one by one until the world is changed. But how does it work? How do we actually disciple people? Discipleship is done and it happens through the spirit of God, the word of God, and the people of God when we work together. The spirit of God, the word of God, and the people of God, the Spirit of God. No person has ever made a decision to follow Jesus without the power of the Holy Spirit spurring it on in their hearts. The Word of God, you cannot grow closer to God without knowing His Word because it is as relevant today as the days it was written. And the church of God, that we were created for each other and we were created to do this together because discipleship happens when the church comes together. And here's the deal. You play a part. We all play a part. Some of you are thinking, Josh, I just made a decision to follow Jesus last week. You play a part. Some of you are thinking, Josh, I didn't go to seminary. I don't speak very well. I'm not an extrovert. I'm not a pastor. You play a part. And we are here to help you play that part because God wants to use you to disciple other people. So if the spirit of God and the word of God and the people of God come together, what does it look like for the people of God to help disciple other people? You disciple as you go. If you want to win at discipleship, you disciple as you go. The literal translation of Matthew 28 is as you are going, you make disciples. As you go to work, you make disciples. 
As you eat dinner with your kids, you make disciples. When you hang out with your friends, you make disciples. Everywhere you go, you are a conduit of God's grace to help other people experience Jesus. You place Jesus at the center of your life and you help other people know him as well. Some of you are thinking, but Josh, I don't speak. I'm not great at this. I haven't been following Jesus a long time. I don't know how many books are in the Bible. I don't know this. I don't know that. I want to encourage you for a moment if any of those thoughts have entered your brain this morning as I've been speaking. In Matthew chapter 28, I did not finish the verses yet, and I want to take this as a time to encourage you because the verse continues and it says this. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, I have authority. Since I have authority, this is what you're commanded to do. But I'm not just leaving you to it. I am with you. Hey, you're worried about not having the words to say on how to disciple. I'm with you. You're worried you're not going to have the courage to say what you need to say. I'm with you. You're worried that you're going to be hated for your beliefs. I'm with you. You're worried that you're going to sound dumb. I'm with you. Jesus gives a promise of the Holy Spirit. Today is Pentecost Sunday. After Jesus ascended into heaven, 40 days later, the Holy Spirit uh, descended upon the earth, coming inside those who have placed their faith in Jesus. Peter spoke boldly the message of Christ, the gospel, on Pentecost Sunday, and thousands were baptized. That same Holy Spirit that lived and dwelled in Jesus rose Jesus from the dead. The same Holy Spirit that lived in Peter when he proclaimed the message of Jesus lives and dwells in you. So even when you're frustrated, even when you don't know what to say, even when you're like, I have no idea how to make disciples, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. He's going to give you the right words to say. He's going to provide the right opportunities. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the Holy Spirit is going to give you power and courage to witness. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, seek the kingdom of God above all else, live righteously, and I will give you everything you need. That when you live a life focused on Jesus, you don't have to worry about being in lack because God will provide everything he needs to you. So when you think about this, so often we think about, you know, placing Jesus to the side and we need to provide what we need to provide. Jesus is standing in heaven. He's sitting in heaven right now. And he's saying, I will unload so much blessing on the people who are focused on living for me. That's what God wants to do. He wants to unload blessings in your life, not just for you, but so that you can make disciples. Discipleship is not about having all the right answers. It's not about knowing every single Bible verse. Discipleship is about just being one step ahead of the other person. So if you've made a decision to follow Jesus, you can help disciple someone who hasn't made a decision to follow Jesus because you've made a decision to follow Jesus. It's one step at a time. About three months after we planted this church, I got a call from an organization called ARC, Association of Related Churches. We launched our church through ARC. And after three months uh, in, I get a call from Josh. He heads up all the coaches. And he says, Josh, we want you to be a pre-launch coach. And I was like, man, I don't feel qualified. We've been only part of this church for three months. He said, Josh, I want you to be a pre-launch coach. And he said, Josh, you will probably be better than our coaches who did it 10 years ago because you just did it three months ago. And there is nobody more relevant to a church planter who's going to uh, plant over the next year than someone who just did it because you just walked through it. When it comes to your life, Jesus wants to help you disciple other people and he will place other people in your way that you can help disciple because they're walking through something similar than you've walked through. And God uses your past, your struggle, your difficulties to help other people take next steps with following Jesus. God has called all of us to make disciples, and this is a chance for us to do it. So practically speaking, here are some of the questions you got to ask if you're going to live out the discipleship path that Jesus has for you. Here's the first one. Who's in your life? What family do you have that don't know Jesus or need to grow closer to Jesus? Who's at your school? Who's in your work? Who's in your neighborhood? Who are some friends 
And here's step one. I'm going to give you kind of a five-step plan today of what it looks like to disciple. Step one, write their name down. Who's that one person in your life that you're praying that you can help disciple them? Help them take a next step. Write their name down and start praying for them. What are you praying? You're praying for opportunities. That's step two. If you pray and ask God for opportunities, he's going to give them to you. I promise. God is looking to give opportunities to Jesus followers who are willing to share his message and to love people. When Jess and I, we went to an all-inclusive resort in Mexico a couple years ago, and uh, we took an Uber back to the airport. And whenever I'm in those situations, I'm trying to think of opportunities to be able to share the gospel message. And I'm talking to our uh, Uber driver, and basically, I think the question I ask is like, what's the main religion, you know, in this area of Mexico? And he answered. And that was kind of my gateway question to be able to share the gospel with that person. Uh, we're always thinking about how can, I, how can I enter in this conversation to talk to someone about Jesus? Uh, whenever I get a haircut, um, I'll sit down and we'll have conversations. I'm always trying to figure out how can I invite this person to church or have a gospel type of conversation? When you walk with life in life with other people, it's a chance for you to say, hey, I'm praying for you in the midst of this hard time. I know you're going through a rough time. I'm gonna pray for you. Would you like to come to church with me? Hey, there's this Bible verse that really resonated with me. Here's the verse, and this is how it helped me get through this tough time. Everywhere we go, we have the chance to disciple other people and help them take a next step. Step three is this. We pray for opportunities, and then we build a friendship. The best discipleship happens over a meal, okay? I think we all know that great things happen over meals. We love to eat. If you're eating lunch, preferably over like a soft pretzel appetizer, okay? Because those are like the best things in the world. The early church was known for its hospitality. So much so that that's how they built their discipleship culture in the early church. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, and breaking, be or breaking bread with each other. I think when it comes to our life, one of the areas we need to grow in as followers of Jesus is with our welcome mats, Come on, your house has the ability to be a conduit of what God wants to do to help disciple people. Man, what if a worn out welcome mat is the greatest indicator of your dedication to make disciples? Come on, what does it look like to start inviting people to your house, to have a hospitable uh, framework that you're going to see more people come to know Christ? Start building friendships to understand that these are not just people that you view as a project, but these are friends to build. These are people who are made in the image of God, and we have the chance to be able to disciple and love them. So we're going to build friendships. Step four, we need to recognize that the church is God's team. These other people who are sitting in this room, they want to help you. These other people sitting in the room, we are doing this together. As the church, we are not spiritual consumers, we are spiritual contributors. We are thinking, what does it look like for me to contribute, to come alongside, to play my part, because God created the church as the chosen agent to spread his gospel and to help other people come to know Jesus. Now, you can lead uh, someone to Christ anywhere. You can lead them to Christ in your living room. You could lead them to Christ over a dinner. But one of the most effective ways to continue to lead people to Jesus is a Sunday gathering. In fact, since we've launched this church, we've had 235 people make a decision to follow Jesus. Can we take a moment to celebrate that today? 235 people. Now, reminder. Just because someone fills out a connect card to say they made a decision to follow Jesus, that is not the finish line. That is the starting point. And we need people who are going to step up and say, we are here to help disciple you in this decision that you just made. Because we're not just about conversion. Conversion's about getting people to heaven. We're about discipleship, which is focused on the God of heaven dictating what he's called us to do on earth. That's discipleship. Discipleship is growing closer to Christ every single day and saying, God, I want to act like you, I want to love like you, and I want to follow you with my life. Step five is this, get in the game. Get in the game. Every Christian has three options. You sit in the stands, and maybe you participate by clapping and saying, great job, everybody. The second option is you can be on the sidelines. You're a little bit closer to the game. Maybe you get in the game if somebody gets hurt. The last option is you get in the game. 
First Corinthians chapter 12 says every single person in this room, you have been given a gift to use and God wants you to use that gift and to steward that gift. In fact, the gift that God gives you, the gift you give back to God is the way you use that gift. Because he gave you that gift. He gave you that ability to teach. He gave you that ability to be hospitable. He gave you that ability to encourage. He gave you the faith. He gave you the ability to pray. He wants you to use it. And our church will never be the fulfillment of what God has for us in this city, in this community, without you and your gift. This church is not about me speaking. It's not about our worship team. It's about us all coming together, using our gifts and stewarding them well because God has given us gifts and we have the chance to live it out. And we wanna help you do that. So how as a church do we come alongside and help you disciple and live out and obey the command that God gave you? Here's the first one. Uh, today, literally after service, uh, we're gonna have, uh, uh, we have our next steps, find your place of purpose. We're gonna spend 30 minutes talking about the vision of the church, and we're gonna give you an opportunity to get plugged into a team. Start serving, start using your gifts to make a difference and understand that since you're part of God's family, we are building this together to see the renewal and the revival of this valley. Second thing we have coming up is we have a discipleship class on June 2nd. It's going to be a 13-week class um, where you can learn the ins and outs of what it means to be a disciple. I'm encouraging every single person at our church, we are, we're going to do this three times a year, to get plugged into it at least once, at least one time. And the reason is because we all need to know what does it mean to follow Jesus in this class is going to give you the next steps of what that looks like. The third thing is we have baptisms coming up. Okay, baptisms, August, I think it's August 18th, okay? In Matthew 28, it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you've never been baptized, it's time to take that next step. Now I wanna teach for a moment. If I just gave that announcement and you said, hey, I got baptized two weeks ago, or I got baptized five years ago, I got baptized 10 years ago. Whenever you hear a baptism announcement, you need to elevate your vision, okay? Your vision and the way you hear that announcement should not be, I've already been baptized. It should be, this is the person I'm praying I'm going to be in that tub with. Every time we make an announcement for baptism, you should be saying, God, I really want to baptize Susie and see her come to know Jesus. Help me do that, Lord. I pray that you open up her mind and her heart to you, Lord. We're elevating our vision that whenever we make announcements about church things happening, it's not just about someone else who's supposed to do them. It's about how am I helping someone else do that? The greatest sign of your spiritual maturity is not just your biblical knowledge, it's who you're helping take a next step with. Have you ever uh, seen those coaching trees? Um, there's like a great coach and then basically he coaches, he coaches and then his assistants start taking head coaching jobs everywhere. And it's like the greater the coach, the greater the coaching tree. So you have Bill Belichick and then he's got like 50 different assistant coaches who've taken head coaching jobs. It shows that he was a great coach but also great coaches were formed beneath him. What's your discipleship tree? And who are the people you've led to Christ? Who are the people you've brought to church to help get connected? Who are the people you've helped get through a difficult time? And have a tree that defines what you're trying to do. Who is that person you're going to be in that tub with on August 18th and you're gonna be baptizing them and you're going to be so pumped because God answered that prayer. We gotta elevate our vision. So here's what I want you to do. And write that person's name down. Who's the one more? Who's that person you're praying for and you're asking and pleading for God to work in their life? And can you just imagine today? Can you imagine what would happen if we all did this one by one by one? Man, the early church grew because it was one by one by one. And we have the opportunity to do that today. And just like a sparkler sender, send off, one by one by one. Who's your one? Who's the person that you're praying for today? What could God do through a disciple-making church? When I was 19 years old, I was an intern at the church that I came from. And I was hanging out in the lobby 
and there was this woman who came up to me and we started having a conversation and she said, what's your last name? And I said, it's Whitlow. And she said, is your mom Julie? I said, yes. She said, I led your mom to Christ when she was 17 years old. I'd never met her. I had no idea who this person was. And I left home, I left that day and I just started thinking about the weight of the decision my mom made, but also the weight of the courage of a 17 year old woman sharing Jesus with someone at her high school. And what was the domino effect of that conversation and what that did in the kingdom? Because ultimately, my mom grew me up in a God-honoring home where I made a decision to follow Jesus, where I gave my life to Christ, and then I started serving in my church. I was an intern and then became a pastor and served there for 10 years, and now we've planted this church, and we've had 235 people make a decision to follow Jesus, and it's not because of me. I'm not saying that, but think about it. The weight of a, a conversation back in 1977 and what that's doing today. You have no idea what is on the other side of your decision to make disciples. Man, you don't know the future Billy Grahams that you're raising up in your household. You don't know the future pastors, the future leaders, the future business people, the future people who are just going to live a life focused on Jesus, focused on prayer and building other people up. You have no idea what that prayer, what that invite, what that love, what that invite to your house to share the gospel could do. You have no idea. I was hanging out with my grandparents before they passed away. They shared a story about when they moved from West Virginia to Toledo. They went to a church right when they moved here and the pastor showed up at their house uh, five hours after church, after they essentially filled out a connect card. We don't do that. If you fill out a connect card, I'm not gonna show up at your house, I promise. But I might, should have, because of what happened with them. He showed up to their house, he knocked on the door. My grandpa opens the door and it's the pastor, he's shocked. And the pastor walks in and he said, hey, here's the vision of our church, but more importantly, here's the gospel message of Jesus that you are loved by God more than you could ever imagine, that you are sinful, more sinful than you could ever know, but Jesus died on a cross for you, and if you place your faith in Christ, you can be made right with God. My grandpa was just so blown away by the fact that a pastor showed up to his house to clearly present the gospel. They got plugged into that church. That's where my dad started going to church, and uh, now I look back at the life that my dad lived and being raised in a God-honoring home. I think about my mom who was led to Christ by another 17 year old and them coming together and having five kids and, and me making a decision to follow Jesus and having the opportunity to do what I get to do today. Man, you never know what God can do when you make a decision to help disciple people. And parents, the most important discipleship you're ever gonna do, it happens in your home. Come on, what does it look like for you to love your kids well? To pray for your kids, to open up the Bible at dinner time and say, God, this is what we believe at this house. And as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Let us be a disciple-making church. God wants to use you. Let's take a moment to pray. God, we thank you for everybody here today. Lord, I pray that we would be a disciple-making church, that every person in here would understand we don't unsubscribe from this message. We, we subscribe to it, Lord. God, we want to help disciple people in this valley. We want more people to come to know you and be in a deep, abiding relationship with you. That conversion is not the goal. Discipleship is the goal, Lord. And we want to disciple as many people in this valley who are lost, who need hope today, Jesus. We pray that a wave of revival would happen in this community community, that we would ask for your blessing to be poured out, that something special would happen right here in this church, in the churches in the West Valley, Lord. We are desperate for you. You make a promise that if your people turn their eyes to you, you can heal their land, God. We pray for that today, Lord. We believe you can move. Allow us to be a church who is wholeheartedly focused on prayer because no great move of God has ever happened without prayer. So God, we pray and we ask for that this morning and we believe that you can do anything at any moment, at any time. God, I pray that you bust the doors wide open. That Lord, this auditorium would be filled in the coming months. That more people would make decisions to follow you. And Lord, we ask for you to move and do what only you can do. God, we want to be part of a move of God. 
that can only be defined by you. That's the prayer of our heart today, Jesus. So thank you for the opportunity to serve you. And we lift all of this up in your name. Amen. Hey, what's up, everyone? My name is Jess. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. We're so glad to have you. And hey, if you made a first time decision to follow Jesus today, we are so excited for you. It is the best decision that you will ever make. I wanna encourage you to go to our website, purposearizona.com slash connect card, and you'll see a connect card on the website. Go ahead and fill that out. It gives us a little bit of information about you and helps us come alongside you and support you as you start this journey. Also, if you just wanna connect with our church or if you wanna invest financially in what God is doing here in the Valley, all of the information is on the website, purposearizona.com. And lastly, we meet in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. at Desert Edge High School, and we'd love for you to join us. Be sure to follow us on social media for any other updates. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week.